both feet on the ground, if you will. Take a deep breath in. Exhale it out through the mouth. Do that again. Deep breath in. Exhale it out through the mouth. So notice what it feels like in your body. What's the relationship that you have with your body? We have work to do. And the time is now for all of us to wake up and do what needs to be done in order to create a world that is fair and free and just and safe and equal and peace-filled and loving for all beings everywhere. The time is now, and we have been called to participate in the necessary social change that can ease this world towards peace. It is what we get to do. Take another deep breath in. Exhale it out. Good. And then open your eyes. So now let me break down a couple of things that was in that, especially related to the children. And this really lines up with the theme about embody love. Um, that's really important to recognize. In the practice of yoga, we're taught that there's no separation between anything, that everything is connected. It, yoga literally means to yoke, to come together and make whole. If you recognize that there's no separation, the understanding then is that that includes our mind and our body. Our thoughts, our psychology impacts our phys physiology. Meaning, as George had said, our bodies remember everything. Every experience, every event, every heartbreak, every loss, every joy, every tradition, it all lives within the flesh. It doesn't just remember, though, what happens in present time. We are also a product of our historical, ancestral, cultural traditions and traumas that lives within us too, influencing us. Within my communities, Within the, within the yoga, the mindfulness communities, there's a word that often gets used, it's detachment. And when I first got into mindfulness practices back in the day, before I had any processing work, before I had therapy, I loved detachment. Big feeling comes up, detach. Big feeling comes up, detach. It took me a really long time to understand that detachment without awareness is dissociation. And that's something within our communities we get really good at, especially the more skilled we get, because we have now the words to explain our big feelings without actually having to feel them. Does that make sense? So I can put words, I can tell you I'm sad, but you won't see it, because I'm detached. No separation between the mind and the body. The body remembers everything. A word that we need to really understand and stand and reclaim, both on an individual and on a collective level, is the word trauma. Trauma is anything that overwhelms our capacity to cope and leaves us feeling helpless, hopeless, out of control, or unable to respond. Everyone experiences trauma. But normally when we think of trauma, we think shock trauma, you know, those unimaginable one-off events, rape, murder, gang violence. But there's also developmental trauma. Developmental trauma, the traumas that happen when we're children before we have the chance to put words into our big feelings, bullying, death of a loved one, divorce. When we experience trauma, what happens is that our brains release chemicals. Those chemicals, stress hormones, adrenaline, uh, cortisol, flood into the, into the body and put us in fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. Our bodies contract. In that moment of contraction, that narrative, that moment, whatever that trauma was, now lives within the cells. And in the practice of yoga, it's some scar. It now lives within the body. That contraction, though, that was part of our survival. We didn't know any other way. That's how our body got into control, to create a sense of safety. That's a sensation. That contraction equals safety. Our body thinks, oh, if I contract, I'll be okay. I won't be abandoned, I won't be bullied, I won't get the rug pulled out from underneath me. Now, if we were raised in an environment where your parents 
gave you an opportunity to scream, rage, cry, what happens is that we're able to discharge the energy. We release it from the body. We're not often taught that. What are we taught? Oh, you're sad? Let me give you a cookie, right? You're angry? Let's go shopping. I'll buy you, I'll buy you a little present. Or you're angry? I'll give you something to be angry about. So we get, we get taught to self-soothe or we get taught to suppress. Either way, it's the suppression of this energy and the energy, that's what makes us one. Everything is energy. That's what connects us. Love is an energy, but so is fear, rage, shame, guilt, grief. That, those are the shadow emotions. And when we experience trauma, like those children experience trauma, that's now the information embodied and alive. Tension, stress, and anxiety are the number one causes of illness, of depression. And it's what makes us reactive. That tension is addictive as a sensation. And it becomes so familiar that it's actually scary to let it go. We don't have any evidence that what's on the other side of that tension is actually safe. It, it, it is liberation. We just don't know that. This is how our entire culture is hardwired to survive, is holding on to the tension. Our culture is in trauma. Our nation is in trauma. We are in trauma. And it's the tools of communication, of yoga, mindfulness, breath work, that allows us to discharge the energy, take ownership of whatever that trauma was, reframe it spiritually, find a reason why things happen as they do, so that we can heal and, and transcend without bypassing it. So the more that I, you, those children, can own their truths, can breathe into their bodies, can express themselves and discharge the energy, the more that contraction becomes expansion, the resistance becomes surrender, and surrender becomes the pathway to love. So what I see so often in our communities are people wanting to do good, wanting to change the world, without understanding that if I'm going out to be of service as an activist, I not only have to sensitize myself to my trauma, but I have to recognize that the communities that I might be in service to may have their own historical, cultural, generational trauma. That my very presence might be triggering and create suffering. The very whiteness of my skin, my able body, my heterosexuality, my gender. The onus has to be on me to take accountability for my own humanity so that I can stand in the presence of another soul, honor the, the, the complexities of the human experience, meet them soul to soul, and have so much self-awareness that if, and probably when, someone else gets triggered, I'm recognizing, oh, they have trauma in their body and no access to discharge that trauma, so they're, respond they're reacting to my presence. I cannot take this personally. That doesn't mean I don't go home and process, cry and express the anger and the rage and the guilt and the grief. But I've got to go into my service really understanding the ways in which I'm complicit just being in this body to the very suffering that exists in this world. And I really do believe from the bottom of my soul that if we want to dismantle the systems that exist in the world that, that create oppression, there's only one true system that needs to be dismantled and it's within ourselves. That means that we have to confront our own internalized racism and sexism, and homophobia, and transphobia, and ageism, and ableism. And there's not a single person here who can't say, no, no, that's not me, I'm not sexist, I'm not homophobic. It's in the body. The moment we can acknowledge it is the moment we can transform it. And when we can begin that true act of activism, peace is not possible, it's inevitable.
So take another deep breath in. Exhale it out through the mouth. Good. Just relax the shoulders. And again, notice. Notice what it feels like in your body. Become that sensitive to what's happening. Because your body will tell you how you feel before you're even engaging with your emotions. Your body will tell you if you're afraid or overwhelmed or scared. So we have work to do. And the time is now. And the beautiful part about this is that we get to do this. We get to do this work. We get to confront our own internalized um, biases and prejudices. We get to have access to amazing teachers. We get to have access to resources and spiritual tools. Because I can promise you this, most people in the world, because of systemic and religious and political oppression, would literally be jailed or killed doing what we're doing right here. Right here. So my feeling is, how dare we not? Go in, go deep, get real. How dare we not just peel back the layers of the shadow that exist within ourselves, confront our own humanity, see it for what it is, recognize the ways we've embodied these stories. So, like Tim Byange told me, we can show up from love. This is what we get to do. And I don't know if we've had access to these practices because of karma or the, just the dumb luck of being born in one longitude over another. But here we are. Before I close this, close this out, I want to take a moment. Does anyone have any questions or anything that, on what I just said? Because I know I just said a lot. Yeah. Anything? Yes, ma'am? Yeah. <gasps> Yay, you. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my, my, cha my challenge within the yoga community, well, again, it's, it's the bypass. And this is yoga and mindfulness in the 21st century. And so it, it's time. It's time. Yeah? yeah. Hi. Okay. <laughs> How you can help others realize our interconnection with our planet. With our what? Our planet. And like making more eco-conscious choices, seeing that mm -hmm. like, okay, this plastic is going to go somewhere. And you mean like this single-use plastic? Exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Which would be great for the next time to go maybe zero waste. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so just how you can actually help someone to feel in their body and in their mind and spirit that they want to make a difference in that respect. Yeah. Not that they have to, but it's their choice. Yeah. Um, my hope is a story like the one I told that talks about permaculture, yoga, emotions, helps people to recognize that there is no separation. That permaculture is just a physical representation of these embodied practices within the earth. And that, again, if we believe that we are all one, then we have a responsibility to be as mindful and as connected as we can be. My commitment personally is not necessarily to create a better world for our children, but it's to raise more conscious, more sustained children to be in service to the planet itself. And so we start there with our families, um, within our own choices that we make, and knowing that we're going to mess up because of entitlement. And because often we don't have to, we're not forced to have to think about it because of the amount of abundance that we have in our culture. That very often, just like this, it's just commonplace. We have to remind ourselves again and again, like, oh, that, oh, that, until it no longer is habitual. And it's, it's again, it's a habit. It's a, an addiction. It's a disease, like anything. It takes time to have to detox from these habits and continually call each other in and up, not out, and to try to find ways to be in these conversations about the, the, the challenges that we experience in our planet and our participation in it. I can't damn my government because of the choices that they're making around climate change and then go home and be using products that are continually creating more and more um, um, toxicity. And so, again, it starts at home, it starts within the individual, and it's always, it's about education. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you choose. You, uh, yeah. yeah. I can't decide. 
Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I can feel your dedication. Um, so yeah, thank you. Curious about the story. I feel like it didn't end. Did you ever go back to Uganda yeah. with the insight you, know, you have? Everybody asks that question. And uh, yes, I did go back to Uganda, but not to work with that particular organization. And the reason why is because they ended up getting a huge amount of funding because they are so remarkable. And instead, I went and um, I, I built a birthing center in a, in a, a nearby village. Um, and so that's the only reason I didn't go back to that particular place, because they got more funding than I could ever provide. Um, but really, the point of that story is, in time, like I said, I raised $4 million over the course of eight years, worked in eight different countries, 23 sustainable pro product projects, until I realized that that's the last thing that I should be doing. That even with the best of intentions, it was still colonization. It was still um, saying like, oh, you guys don't have this right. Let's us come from the West and show you how it's actually done. It took me a really long time to realize like, ah, that's not right. So I actually ended that program, even though it was so successful, because I couldn't sit with the hypocrisy of what I was perpetuating. And instead, what I created is here in the United States called Learning and Listening Tours. And for example, the last one we did, it was just last month, it was called Race in America. Now, I don't, this is in Alabama. I don't go and teach about race. I hire, though, people of color, artists, historians, activists, to come in and teach us from... Um, from slavery to civil rights, the progressive movements of the day, and visit different institutions that are working around racial terrorism to help us to get educated. Our job is to shut up, listen, and then at night, I, through the practice of yoga, help them to embody the fear, the rage, the guilt, the grief, the shame, and help them to process what's coming up for them. But it's really learning and paying the leaders in, in those communities to help educate us. And so I work with the indigenous communities. I think we're going to do New Orleans this year. Like, it's really important for me now. Education is critical. Um, and especially as a, as a white woman of privilege, it's like, I just need to, like, zip it. Educate my community and pay people who actually are making a difference um, because of their lived experience. So that's what we're doing now. Um, and I think it's more sustainable than what was happening before. Okay. One more, and then I'm going to... Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Zahuva. Hi. Um, I'd like to give you an acknowledgement. I don't have a question. I'm, I'd like your permission to do that. Sure. <laughs> uh, 14 years ago, my sister took one of your yoga teacher training courses. Her name is Hana. No. And she came with her two-year-old, Her, I think she was an infant at the time. My mom was there. And she was very influenced. And uh, recently, um, she got diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And, when she, and um, when she was asked, you know, what it was that she wanted, she wanted a tape of yours. And, you know, she... She is recovering, and if you were to ask her, like, what is it that gave you the most sense of hope and courage, she would say it was your tape. And I wish I could say which tape it was. <laughs> okay. It's okay. But I want to thank you, because it's so clear to me why. Mm -hmm. In feeling yeah. your energy and hearing your stories, your commitment, your love, your self-awareness, um, it's very clear to me why she would single that out as giving her the most hope and courage. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you so much yeah. from the bottom thank of you. my heart. Thank you. Thank you. How, how, is, how is Hannah today? What? How is Hannah today? Uh, she just had her last uh, uh, radiation. Uh, She's okay. feeling alive, and there's such a shift in her yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the. Me, you know, she is a yoga practitioner, but I, I just feel like it's the same path that you're speaking yeah, of. Yeah. It was all about me, 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 and now I, I see this reaching outside herself. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, and I'm glad she's doing well. Yeah. Um, very often our pain is our purpose, and the very thing that leads you into your, your transformational work is the very thing that will give you the most skill to be in service. So I want to close this actually with one final story, um, and then I'm just going to ground it. 
Um, and in this story, there's no children in this room, is there? Are there little children? Is there? No, besides you up there. Uh, <laughs> a little child? What do I got here? Like how old? Twelve. Okay, I see twelve. I'm going to abbreviate something. Now, I'm telling this story because it's an important story. I'm going to, I'm going to use um, like uh, curse words in this that's kind of graphic. Only because, though, I didn't tell this. This is not my story. This is my father's. These are his words. So I can't, I don't know any other way to, to do this, except I am going to abbreviate, and you're going to have to use your imagination on one part. But I have a feeling there's enough of you in this room, and I'm sure I've been around the block, that you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. All right? And the other swear word I think, I think, I think, I think you can handle. Um, otherwise, Mom, you're going to have some explaining to do. Uh, but I think that this ties up everything that I'm talking about. Everything. I mentioned my father earlier, and um, my father and I were very, very close. And like I said, in time, he became a yoga teacher and a meditation practitioner. And I was very fortunate to have a very, very rare and privileged relationship with my father where we could drop in. My father was diagnosed with cancer, with kidney cancer, in um, about 2003. And he was given four months to live. And he lived another seven years. And we used to call my father cockroach daddy because nothing could kill him. Um, until that was no longer true. And we found out that there were no more treatments to be done. There was no more time to be had. And my father came in to tell me that he was going to die. Um, and they had only a few weeks left. The next morning, my father woke me up, and he says, get out of bed, I want to go for a walk with my daughter. And we get, I lead him outside, and at this point, my father can barely walk, and I'm holding him up, and he walks me to the edge of the lake behind their yard. And we're both looking up at the sun is rising, and my father's very quiet. And he says, let me tell you a little something about life. It'll F you in the A. <laughs> he didn't use those words. <laughs> and when I turn to protest, he grabs me and pulls me into his chest. And he says, but it'll also give you this daughter to hold and this sunrise and more mu moments of beauty than any one of us will ever deserve. He said, kid, I'm going to tell you something. He said, this next part's going to get rough. A little bit more rough for me than anyone else. He said, but it's going to get rough. He said, my dying is going to break your heart. Let it. Let it crack you open. Feel everything. Don't miss a tragic, awful, magnificent moment. And then he turns me around so that I could look directly into his eyes. And he says, for you to hurt this badly means you got to love that big. And if that's all you get in a single lifetime, you are more than blessed. He said, I'm going to tell you something. And he goes, I hope you never forget this. And he says, if you ever write a book, tell him that your dead dad told you this. <laughs> he said, love big, forgive always, do good, and don't be an asshole. <laughs> he said, that's yoga, and that's a life well lived. It's really that simple. So sit on up and close your eyes. And place your palms into namaste. And together we take another very deep breath in. Exhale it out through the mouth. And we close this moment by giving thanks to God for all of it. For the light, for the shadow, for all the tender, weird, funky, magnificent moments in between. We ask, Spirit, may we never take a second of this journey for granted. And instead, may we live in awe and in wonder for the beauty and for the magnificence of it all. We ask, may we transform our narrative. May we see the magnificent even in the grotesque. We ask for the tools, for the skills, for the strength, for the awareness, for the patience, the empathy, and the acceptance to continue doing our inner work. And then we ask, dear God, as we heal, as we grow, as our hearts open to love, may we serve and may we together create a world that is free and just and equal and safe and fair and free for all beings 
everywhere. And then together we offer this blessing of gratitude and this commitment to serve with one single om. Take a deep breath in. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.